and my my own dreams are in creating uh, robots and uh, artificial intelligence systems that a human can love. And I think there's something about uh, mortality and fear of mortality that is essential for implementing in our AI systems. Yeah. And so well, maybe can you comment on that? Like, well, uh, on, on uh, uh, so this is a, this is a different perspective on, on on your work, sure. Which is like, how do we engineer a human? Yeah. So no, this is awesome, Lex. I'm delighted that you said that. First of all, and I may mention this to you, and I don't, I can't remember because I am seeing out. When you first <laughs> contacted me, yeah, I had just been told I have to learn more about your work because I'm working with some very talented people in New York. And they're they're writing a screenplay uh, for a movie about an artificial intelligence. It's a female AI mm -hmm. and set in like thirty years in the future. A and basically, the little twist. This is how I had to read Heidegger. So these people call me, and they're like, "We're making a movie." It's based on Becker and your work and Heidegger and this other philosopher, Levinas, and then another philosopher, Sylvia Benzo, who's an Italian philosopher. Mm -hmm. And the long short story is the movie is about supposedly the most advanced artificial intelligence entity, an embodied one, mm -hmm. uh, and who human form human form yeah. who finds out who is having uh, uh having essentially existential anxieties and the i think the project is called a dinner with her or something and it doesn't really matter but the punchline is that she finds out that her creator has made her mortal and so the question is what happens phenomenologically and behaviorally to an an artificial intelligence who now knows that it's mortal and it's actually the same question that you're posing yeah and that is is that necessary in order for an AI to approximate humanity. Yeah, I, th I think, yeah, so the intuition, again, it's uh, it's unknown, but uh, I think it's absolutely, I think it's absolutely necessary. Um, a lot of people, this, the same kind of shallow thinking that people have about our own end of life, our own death, is the same way people think, of, I think, about artificial intelligence. It's like, well, okay, so yeah, you, so within the system, there's a there's a terminal position where like there's there's a there's a point at which it ends. You just the program ends. Uh, there's a goal state. There's a you reached an end point. But the thing is, uh, making that end a thing that's also within the program, exactly. like like the making the thing yeah. like and then it's also the mystery of it so yeah. the thing is <laughs> we don't know what the hell this death thing is i mean it's not like um it's not like we i mean the program doesn't give us information about the meaning of it all exactly and the, the, that's where the terror is I, and and i it feels like i mean uh in the language that you you would think about is um is the terror of this death or like anticipation of it or thinking about it is the creative force that builds everything. Right. And that feels like, a, uh, you know, that feels really important to implement. Again, it's very difficult to know how to do technically currently, but it's important to think about. What I find is, you mentioned like screenplays and so on, is sci-fi folks and uh, philosophers are the, the only ones thinking about it currently. And that's it, what... These folks have convinced me. Yeah, and engineers aren't, which is uh, I get. Yeah, mo most of the most most of the things I talk about, I get kind of um, uh, people roll their eyes from the engineer well, perspective. Not these folks. <laughs> that they're like, 
because I again I saw your name and they're like, wait a minute, I've just seen that. They're like, here's someone you should check out. Yeah. So yeah, this was a, a delightful confluence. Yeah, I was a, I was a huge fan of um, your work and uh, Ernest Becker, and it's, um, it's funny that not enough people are uh, talking about it. Yeah, I don't know what to do with that. I think that there's a possibility to create real, deep, meaningful connections between AI systems and humans. Absolutely. And uh, I think some of these things of fear mortality are essential. Are yeah. essential for the element of human experience. I don't, I don't think it might be essential to create general intelligence, like very intelligent machines, but to create a machine that connects to a human in some yeah. deep way. Would, what's your view? Not to make me the interviewer, but what's your view about um, machine ethics? Can you imagine an ethical AI without some semblance? of yeah uh, so, finitude let's say well i i think ethics is a it's a you know there's a there's a trolley problem that's often used yeah. in the work that i've done at Joshua MIT. Green. Yeah, yeah with uh with autonomous vehicles in particular oh yeah yeah uh that people i think they offload they ask like how would a machine deal with an ethical situation that they themselves the humans don't know how to deal exactly. with Exactly. And so I don't know if a machine is able to uh, do a better job on, eth on difficult ethical questions, but I certainly think to behave properly and effectively in this world, it needs to be uh, have a fear of mortality and like be able to even dance. Because I don't think you can solve ethical problems, but you have to, uh, I, I think like ethics is like a dance floor and you have to just, you have to uh, dance properly with the rest of the humans. Like if people are nice. dancing tango, you have to dance in the same kind of way. And for that, you have to have a fear of mortality. Like I think of uh, more practically speaking, I, I said autonomous vehicles, like the way you interact with pedestrians fundamentally has to have a sense of mortality. So uh, the, when pedestrians cross the road, now I've watched, um, well, certainly 100 plus hours of pedestrian videos. There's a kind of social uh, contract where you walk in front of a car and you're putting your life in the hands of another human yes, being. Yes, that's right. And, and if, like death is is uh, is in the car, like, in the game that's being played, death is right there. Uh, it's part of the calculus. It's not, but it's not like a simple calculus. It's not a simple equation. It's uh, it's an est. It's a. I mean, I don't know what it is, but it's it's in the it's in there, and uh, it has to be part of the optimization problem. Like it's not as simple as so. From the computer vision, from the uh, artificial intelligence perspective, it's detecting that there's a human, estimating right, uh, uh, right, uh, estimating the trajectory, like treating everything like it's a uh, billiard balls, uh, as opposed to like being able to construct an effective model the world model of the what the person's thinking what they're going to do what are the different possibilities of how the scene might evolve i think requires having some sense of yeah fear of fear of mortality of mo mortality i don't see the the thing is i think it's really important to think about i, I can be honest enough to say that it's i haven't been able to figure out how to engineer any of these things. Right. Uh, but I do think it's really, really important. Like I have, uh, so I have a bunch of Roombas here. I can show it to you after uh, that I've, Roombas is a robot that yeah. does um, vacuums the floor. And I've had them um, make different sounds. Like I had them scream in pain. <laughs> and it, it, uh, it, uh, you immediately anthropomorphize. Absolutely. And it creates a, I don't know, knowing that they can feel pain. See, I'm, I'm speaking like knowing uh, that I immediately imagine that they can feel pain and then it Im immediately draws me closer to them. Yes. At the human experience. And that there's, there's something in that that should be engineered in, in our, in our systems. It feels like, yeah. Uh, I, I believe personally, I don't know what you think, but uh, 
I believe it's possible for a robot and a human to fall in love, for example, in the f in the future. Oh, uh, I think it's yeah, it's already there. <laughs> no, well, I, uh, there's yeah. a certain kind of deep connection with technology. Yeah, but I mean a real like you would choose to marry. Um, I mean, again, it sounds. Uh, uh, I'll find a book title and I'll send it to you. And it's a serious consideration of people who started out with these sex dolls but it turned into a relationship of enduring significance that the woman who wrote the book is not willing to dismiss as a perversion yeah that's what uh you know people kind of joke about sex robots which is funny uh like it's a it's a funny i mean there's a lot of stuff about robots that's just kind of fun to talk about that is is not necessarily connected to reality uh, people joke about sex robots, but if you actually look how sex robots, which are pretty rare these days, yeah. are used, they're not used by people who want sex. Precisely. They're, they're actually- uh, They're companions. They're compa they become companions. Yeah. <laughs> they, it, it's, uh, yeah, it's fascinating. And they're just, we're, we're not even talking about any kind of intelligence. We're talking about just, I mean, human beings seek companionships. We're deeply lonely. I mean, that was the other- sense I have that I don't know if I can articulate clearly, you can probably do a better job, but I have a sense that there's a deep loneliness within all of us. Absolutely. In the face of death, it feels like we're yep. alone. So, you know, the what drew me to the existential take on things, Lex, was the, uh, uh, who is it, Rollo May and Erwin Yalom, right? about existentialism and they're like look it, it what there's different flavors of existentialism but they all have in common what is it four universal concerns the overriding one is about death and that next is choice and responsibility the next one is existential isolation and they're like that's one of the things about consciousness that and the last one is meaninglessness but the existential isolation point is you know we are by virtue of consciousness able to apprehend that unless you're a siamese twin you are fundamentally alone and because it is claimed it's eric from uh, in a book called Escape from Freedom, he's like, look, you, you're you smart enough to know that the most direct way that we typically communicate with our fellow human beings is through language. But you also know that language is a pale shadow of the totality of our interior phenomenological existence. Therefore, there's always gonna be times in our lives where even under the best of circumstances, you could be trying desperately to convey your thoughts and feelings, and somebody listening could be like, yeah, I get it, I get it, I get it, and you're like, you have no fucking idea what I'm talking about. Yeah. So you can be desperately lonely in a house where you live with 10 people in the middle of Tokyo where there's millions. Yeah, yeah, it's the great Gatsby. Yeah, you could be alone. Precisely. At a party. Yeah. Exactly. 